welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, I'm really delighted to have Dr. Steve Stewart Williams on the podcast. Dr. Stewart Williams is a New Zealander who moved to Canada, then to Wales, and then to Malaysia, where he is now an associate professor of psychology at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia campus. His first book, Darwin, God, and the Meaning of Life, was published in 2010, and his latest book is called The Ape That Understood the Universe, How the Mind and Culture Evolved. Steve, great to chat with you today. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, man. So I've been following your Twitter feed for a couple of years now. Oh, great. Cool. Yeah. And I've watched this sort of rise of Dr. Steve Stewart Williams and the popularity. Uh, you've noticed that too, right? You've noticed that, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, you get a lot more likes on your posts. Yeah. 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 It's, it's sort of, it's grown exponentially. Yeah. It's what gone, do you attribute faster. that to? Uh, uh, my good looks. <laughs> so it's just that one picture you put up on Twitter of yourself? <laughs> yeah, that, that was the turning point. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I read quite a bit and I guess I just got into a habit of finding bits and pieces that jump out at me and that spark my interest, screenshotting them, putting them up, things like that. Well, that's cool. Yeah, your work really is broad. I mean, you cover, um, you're very interested in all of human nature and not just the nice bits, but it includes the nice bits, but also the naughty bits of human nature as well, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, what we are, what we evolved as a, as a whole species and what we have in common with other animals. Um, you start out your book, your new book uh, with this aliens challenge, you know, what would happen if an alien dropped in on us? How would it view our species, particularly if the alien was from uh, Beetle Guys 3? Yeah. Yeah is the planet that you talked about there. So I thought that was, you crafted this whole, you know, imaginative scenario. And, you know, I was cracking up. It's funny to view human, I mean, it's what comedians do every day, right? They view humans from, yeah, yeah. from a planet perspective, but you got a chance to play with that as a scientist, you know? So do you want to talk a little about what these aliens would think of what you refer to as us crazy meat robots? Uh, yeah, sure. So long story short, I guess, is that the aliens would be, be quite puzzled by us. Because set it up, so this is an alien that doesn't have male and female, uh, it doesn't fall in love, it doesn't, it doesn't have families, it's uh, sort of cultural institutions that we do, such as religions and art and music, things like that. So pretty much everything that we do, and, and a lot of the stuff that's most central to our species and that we take most for granted, just unfamiliar to this hypothetical alien. So I was puzzled by all that. Um, I also highlight some of the ways in which our species is, is different than other animals, which would be a, sort of an additional layer of puzzlement for the aliens. And then I pivot to, so, so I focus on some of the, the areas that I get into later in the book. So sex differences. Now this is an asexual alien, doesn't have male and female. So it's going to be puzzled initially by the fact that most humans are either male or female, and that the males and females differ in a number of ways. They differ physically. They also differ, on average, in a number of psychological ways. Uh, it's going to be puzzled by the fact that people fall in love. It's going to be puzzled by the fact that people who have fallen in love get upset if the person they're in love with becomes involved with somebody else. Uh, another thing that might puzzle the alien scientist is the fact that we tend to channel parental care toward our own offspring rather than just sort of any old offspring. We're, we're quite um, uh, selective in how, we, uh, in how we distribute parental care. The alien might say, why, not, why shouldn't we just help everybody? It would be puzzled by how good we are to our relatives, because the alien doesn't have family, but also how compared to most other animals, we're very good to non-relatives as well. We often cooperate a lot with our non-relatives. That's some of the nice stuff. And then moving to the cultural sphere, it would be puzzled by the fact that we have invisible beings that we pray to. It would be puzzled by the fact that we synchronize our behavior to different tones and things like that, and how we spend hours staring at flat screens and admiring splodges of color on canvas and, and all these other kind of odd cultural things that we do as well. You know, as I see this thought experiment, it, it actually makes me appreciate being human more. It maybe had the oh, opposite cool. effect. Oh, no, maybe that was the, the point. I don't know. <laughs> but it's like it, there's an ironic effect there where I realize, like, I start to feel empathy for the 
alien as being so lacking in fundamental humanity. Do you know uh, what I mean? Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. That's interesting. Because there are like humans that probably, you know, you know, I always wonder like, what is it like if you were a bona fide psychopath, right? What would the world look like? And it must feel for a lot of them like, why do people hug each other? Why do people love each other? Like, it must not compute. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You see what I'm saying? So your thought experiment is real for some humans probably on this earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really good point. And I think with psychopaths, we often think about the bad effects they have on other people. But I guess something else is that they're missing out on a lot of stuff right. that the rest of us, you know, get to enjoy. Yeah. I've always like, been, uh, likewise, yeah. just had compassion for like all variation, right? As long as they're not like killing me. <laughs> you know, then, yeah. Yeah. Indeed. yeah. Or, or anyone else really. But anyway, yeah. so it was funny and it was really quite profound. You know, that opening, a uh, good way to start a book, by the way. You know, right. really you. kind of hooks you in. You said something, you said humans are strange fish. And then, you know, and then you talk a lot about, about how we're apes. Are we a fish-ape hybrid? What, what are we? Uh, well, the way the alien's looking at it, so, so you, like tetrapods, so mammals and reptiles and birds and amphibians, we all, the traditional way to say it is that we evolved from fish. But a lot of cladists would argue that actually, in a certain sense, it makes sense to say that we actually are fish. We belong to that clade. We're a sort of sub-branch of this clade that we call fish. It's not the everyday way to use the language, but it is maybe how the alien would see it. It wouldn't draw the distinction that we naturally do between fish that are in the water and, and the land fish, as the alien says it. So to the alien, and, and to Neil Shubin, the paleontologist, actually, the same way he once said, I heard a talk where he said that um, uh, when he looks at a picture of Einstein, so most people see, they see a physicist, they see the guy that came up with E equals MC squared, they see this, a genius. He said what he sees is a crazy morphed out fish because we all evolved from fish and, and we're still in a certain sense. It's a little reductionistic. <laughs> well, indeed, indeed, yeah. <laughs> so we are apes. We belong to that group. But apes belong to the fish group in this way of looking at it. And um, yeah, that's how the alien saw it. I think it captures something true, which is, is that we do belong to that group. We are fish-like in a number of ways. Our, our limbs, our arms uh, are modified fins, for instance, and our jaws are modified, uh, what's the word, gills. Uh, uh, yeah, modified gills. Modified gills, yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's the sense in which we're modified, sort of morphed out fish. We're other stuff too, though. I always thought of it as fish as modified humans. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Fish as modified. <laughs> okay, so look, there's so many different ways we can go here. I think that in order to really build up to the climax of your thesis, we should do this in steps. So sure. let's start with a good grounding of the first major perspective of your book, which is evolutionary psychology. And then we'll get into why evolution is not enough. But let's start with evolutionary psychology. How does that singular perspective, how far does that take us in understanding human nature? Uh, it takes us quite a long way. So it's based on the sort of the genes eye view of evolution. So the basic idea is that natural selection creates uh, organisms that are designed to pass on their genes. And the, the rationale for that is that, so if you imagine that you were a gene and you had an effect on the organism in which you're sitting that caused it not to have offspring and not to pass itself on, or if you did so less competently than your neighbor, then you are going to disappear from the gene pool. So the genes that stick around in the gene pool are the ones that have effects that mean that they will be passed on at a faster rate than competing versions of the same genes. And that applies to the body, but it applies as well to the mind. Certain sort of foundational aspects of the mind. No. So certain base. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid so. Man. It doesn't stop at the neck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to break it to you. Oh. <laughs> so basic emotions like like fear, for instance, fear sort of motivates behavior. It motivates us to stay clear of danger, stay clear of the edge of the cliff, run away from the bear, whatever it is, and that leads us to survive, which gives us more opportunity to, to have offspring and ultimately pass on our genes. Same sort of story for sexual desire that has. It has the same effect in an obvious kind of way. It leads us to engage in behaviors that, in the absence of contraception, at least, result in offspring. Parental love, same deal. We look after these little offspring once they appear on the scene. That's the basic kind of idea of an evolutionary psych. Those examples, I think, probably reasonably uncontroversial, I think. Evolutionary psych, though, takes it a little further. It takes it to explain other aspects of human behavior that do push it into some more controversial waters. Particularly when we're talking about the mind. Indeed, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you go through a lot of pictures of evolution that are not as 
true and complex don't fully capture the complexity of the matter and you kind of work your way up. I thought that was really neat. So you talk about, you know, some people talk about, think evolution survival the fittest and that's not quite right, right? Yeah. I mean, it does tend to favor survival. You've got to survive in order to reproduce and to look after Ken. But if you were to, for instance, to survive for a thousand years, but never have any offspring, then the moment that you did finally die, well, your genes are going to go out of existence just as surely as if you'd survive for 20 seconds. So survival alone is not enough. So we can rule that out for a start. And at the very least, you need to, to reproduce and have offspring. Okay. So then some people might think like, oh, well, then we're really just baby making machines. You know, that's what the organisms are going for. Yeah. Talk to me a little about that. Well, that's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't cover all adaptations. So one problem is, say you had a thousand babies. If none of those babies survive to adulthood, then again, you're going to have as few genes go forward into the future as if you were to just have no offspring. So you need to have babies that survive to have babies themselves, basically. A number of ways you can do this. One is it's just like a numbers game. A lot of species, lots of insects, for instance, just pump out uh, fish, just pump out tons and tons and tons of offspring, most of which don't make it and just a tiny minority do. The approach that uh, mammals and birds take, though, is they have many fewer offspring, but they invest a lot more into each individual offspring. And it's a different part to the same goal, but it's not just about producing offspring. It's about producing those offspring, bringing them those offspring to a breeding age as well. And it's a further step in the right direction. Yeah. You know, it just ought to mean that, you know, mm. I mean, I totally agree. Like, humans are really strange in the animal kingdom. And in so many ways, but one way is like we can be evolutionarily losers and be human success stories. Yep. Like, isn't that fascinating to think about? Like, you know, because when we get into these kinds of discussions, I think a lot of there are a lot of misunderstand. You would be the first one to say there are a lot of misunderstandings about evolutionary psychology. But there's this misunderstanding that, like, you know, people get so emotional about it when we talk about it from the genes eye perspective. When we really shouldn't get that, we're talking about like kind of like psychopath perspective that yeah, it exists, you know, totally. like, you know, yeah. we want to understand it. It doesn't care about us, the organism, you know, the genes eye perspective doesn't care. It just wants to propagate itself in the future. And in fact, we have this peculiar ability as a whole organism to override that yeah. to a certain extent, you know, not limited freedom, but we have this amazing ability to say, you know what, I'm going to define success differently than you. Mr. Gene or Mrs. Gene. Exactly. You know, do you know what yeah, I mean? Mr. Miss, I totally do. So, Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Gene, yeah. who cares what they, they want, right? Yeah. Um, it's our, our goals and ambitions seem to come quite detached from the, the evolutionary basis. It is fascinating, right? And so, we might choose, rather than having tons and tons of kids, we might decide instead that we want to devote ourselves to some other cause yeah. in a way that I think is quite unique to human beings that we do that. Yeah, devote ourselves to creativity and then exactly. just jump in the gun, but, you know, like, producing works that live on through generations is also a you know a form of cultural success, right? So yeah. Yep. So we're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to that didn't mean to drop that just yet. Okay. So working our way up to the complexity of this, I'm gonna give you a statement and tell me if this will get you top marks if I took a, <laughs> a test in your class. Okay. Yep. Natural selection is all about inclusive fitness. Genes are selected if they enhance the inclusive fitness of their bearers. Adaptations are designed to maximize the organism's inclusive fitness and organisms taken as a whole, which I just like that phrase, whole organism, are inclusive fitness machines. Does that capture the complexities more? Very, very close. Yeah. So you get a really good mark for that statement. So that's the next step beyond where before, right? So B where plus? before was... B plus or A minus? Uh, no, I think an A minus. Okay. Maybe even an A. Maybe even Ooh. an A. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's not just about having offspring, right? That's what's called direct fitness. Inclusive fitness also includes what's called indirect fitness. So uh, direct fitness is your personal reproductive success, the number of offspring that you have. Indirect fitness is your contribution to the reproductive success of genetic relatives. And you need to add that on as well, to add a bit more complexity, and then you get to the inclusive fitness perspective, which I think is an excellent account of most adaptations. So it includes survival, adaptations for survival, adaptations for reproductive success, and also adaptations that increase the survival and reproductive success of close relatives. Okay, so what would be the A plus? The A plus, would the A plus have to go to a gene center yeah. perspective? You would have to go to a gene center yeah. perspective, yeah. So the inclusive fitness perspective, basically um, talking about the organism's fitness in terms of you get selection for traits that maximize the organism's inclusive fitness, whereas the gene center view 
you get selection for genes that maximize their own fitness. And most of the time, those two things are the same. So it's just two different ways of saying the same thing. There are cases, though, where you have a gene that will be selected, which does not actually enhance the inclusive fitness of its owner. Give me an so example. Oh, yeah. An example would be like segregation distorted genes. So these are genes that, so, so most genes, right, they got a 50-50 chance of making it into a sperm or into an egg. But segregation distorted genes are genes that have some kind of effect. That means that they bias the coin flip, that they improve their chances. They have a greater than 50% chance of getting into the gamete, the sperm or the egg. Now, in doing that, they either have no effect on the organism's inclusive fitness, or in some cases, they actually lower the organism's inclusive fitness. But they can nonetheless be selected just because they're good for themselves. So in other words, this is an example that where the gene is getting selected, but can't be explained in terms of inclusive fitness. Mm. So I think that sort of is a case where the gene's eye view goes beyond inclusive fitness. And because it can explain that case, provides a more accurate view, I think, of what's going on than inclusive fitness. So I recently got the opportunity to try Care of, a monthly subscription vitamin service that delivers personalized vitamin and supplement packets right to your door. I found the whole process really easy and even fun to go through. Care of's fun online quiz asks you about your diet, health goals, and lifestyle choices, and takes only about five minutes to complete. Personally, I said that I was most interested in improving my heart health, digestion, and stress. And once I finished the personalized quiz, I was provided with a list of recommended vitamins and was given the option to add more vitamins in different categories if I wanted to. The vitamins were delivered right to my door in personalized, easy-to-remember daily packs, which were just perfect for someone like me who was always so busy and on the go. I also found it really useful to remember which vitamins I already took, a problem I sometimes have with all the vitamins thrown around my apartment. I also like that Care of provided all the research supporting each of their recommendations and that each of their recommendations were backed by a scientific advisory board. I'm pleased to announce that for listeners of the Psychology Podcast, you can get 25% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins by visiting takecareof.com and entering the code TPP. Again, for 25% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins, visit takecareof.com and enter the code TPP. Now back to the show. So, you talk about how we're really rewriting our understanding of adaptations. What are some yeah. common misunderstandings of what an adaptation is and how are we rewriting that? Well, I think this, this kind of view it changes the way we, we look at adaptations in, in a kind of interesting way. So if you think of classic adaptations like the peacock's tail, in effect, the peacock's tail is an adaptation designed to pass on the genes that give rise to the peacock's tail. If you think of sharp teeth that the lion has, likewise, that's a, an adaptation designed to pass on those sharp teeth. In an individual organism, these things lead the peacock or lead the lion to pass on all of their genes. Mm. But the genes that give rise to those traits, they're, they're mixed and matched through the generations, pretty much every other gene in the gene pool. And the only genes that they consistently benefit are the ones that actually give rise to those adaptations. So their sort of ultimate effect is just to keep themselves in the gene pool. So how does that rewrite our understanding of adaptations? Like, what was the old view? Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, so the old view was from a more organism-centered view. So it was to enhance the inclusive fitness or, or the fitness gotcha. of uh, the organism in question. So yeah, the peacock's tail is for the benefit of the peacock, for passing on its genes to, to future progeny. Okay. It's kind of turning that around. So the peacock's tail is instead for the benefit of the peacock, the, the genes giving rise to the, uh, the peacock's tail. Okay, well, that is interesting, and it, it opens a window as well to group selection, right? And that is a very interesting form of selection that yeah. also takes us beyond this inclusive fitness-only view, right? So can you talk a little bit about group selection? I can. There's a group selection. It's kind of a, it's a controversial idea in biology, and it has defenders and detractors. There are actually different versions of it. So one version, it doesn't actually take us beyond inclusive fitness theory. It's actually just another way of construing mm. inclusive fitness. Fair enough. But a common view, though, is that it does go beyond. So some people argue, David Sloan Wilson, for instance, argue that, that as well as selection among individuals, you get selection among different groups. So a group that does better, he argues, you can get selection for traits that actually make the individual that has those traits slightly worse off if at the same time it makes the group in which that individual is operating perform better. So like within groups, you have selection for traits that make the individual do better within that group. But then between groups, you have selection for traits that make the group as a whole do better compared to other groups. So it's uh, inclusive fitness versus group beneficial traits. And, and does I'm, that actually happen? 
Yeah, I was going to ask. That's exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm not 100% sure I would, if you forced me to take a side, I, I would put my money probably that it doesn't particularly happen. It could happen in principle. I think that group selection, in the sense that it's something more than inclusive fitness, I think probably hasn't had any influence or, or much influence on our, our species or most others. I think probably most of it is captured by inclusive fitness. You know, I mean, this, this gets us to altruism, doesn't it? And, and, and a real yep. understanding of, you know, is everything, you know, the most diehard cynic, you know, concept is like everything you do for others is really just to, at the end of the day, ultimately selfish. And I actually yep. really liked your nuanced distinction between altruism and selfishness. It was one of the most precise definitions I've seen in the whole literature. I mean, I've, I've been reading this evolutionary psychology literature for more than a decade, and I've never seen mm. anyone pinpoint that. And it relates to some recent research I'm doing. So that's why I wanted to talk oh, to you about cool. it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. you you make a very good point. You say, well, sort of would occur to me that altruism uh, is not what you sound like at all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was trying to do your accent. <laughs> that, sound like a posh Brit. I know, it did all of a sudden, did it, like a queen, you know, uh, <laughs> queen mother. Yeah, okay, I won't, I won't do that again. But um, you're like, well, it occurred to me that altruism, you're helping someone, but you're getting intrinsic pleasure for it. And it made me think of like Kant's, you know, categorical imperative, you know, like helping others as not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. So I saw a great linkage there between what you said to Kant's categorical imperative. I don't know if you thought about that, but it's in. And then selfishness is... Well, you know, you're just helping someone as a means to solely benefit your own genome. Mm. So this is a really, really cool distinction. It links to, and it, it really plays out in lots of, you know, it links to lots of things. Like it even links to like, and I always have to bring up Abraham Maslow at least once in every podcast chat because he <laughs> yeah. really had so much figured out. Even before evolution psychology, you know, he really understood yeah. a lot about human nature. And he really made the distinction between what he called be love, being love which is love for all of humankind and getting intrinsic joy and pleasure in being loving. You know, that's what be love is. It's being loving. You're not doing love, doing love so that you can X, Y, Z, right? I say, yeah. 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 So the be love is, is that love for its own sake? Yes. As opposed that's to what love I would as, map as a means to, to your altruism. Yeah. 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 As opposed to love and altruism as a means to some other end. Yeah. But then he yeah. also, and this is where it links to recent research I'm working on, which I haven't talked about with anyone, but I thought it'd be fun to just improvise, you know, just riff and get your thoughts, you know, is that he also had a, this construct that I'm trying to operationalize called healthy selfishness. So mm -hmm. I have scales. I just, I'm working on this paper right now where I'm trying to empirically distinguish between unhealthy selfishness and healthy selfishness. Yeah, and yeah. so even altruism aside, there's a form of selfishness where you're being selfish, but it's not hurting anyone. And it's yeah. benefiting you. And then there's sort of like psychopath type of selfishness, you know, like yeah, where it's antagonistic yeah. and manipulative. Yeah, where you hurt other people. Yeah. yeah. So you can actually be selfish as an end in itself as well and it not yeah. hurt anyone. So anyway, these are some distinctions I want to put forward. I wanted to get your thoughts on what I just said. And you talk a little bit yeah. about how this relates to and maybe an emerging understanding of culture, the evolution sure, of culture, say. I should say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I think going back to the cynics arguments where the cynics argue that we're not actually ever altruistic. It's never genuine altruism. Uh, it's always a means to some other end, whether that end is personal happiness or genetic propagation. I suppose I should say that. So I don't agree with the cynics on that. Mm -hmm. I do think that, that we are gen sometimes genuinely altruistic. Yeah, me too, um, by the way. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And I think, you know, people do sometimes think or they, they feel as if an evolutionary explanation for altruism kind of sucks the wind out of the sails of altruism and, and just renders it not real. And they treat it as if it unmasks altruism as actually being not real and ultimately just selfishness. I don't think that's true. I think one distinction I draw is between, there, there are two ways you can interpret it, right? You could interpret it as at the proximate level, at that psychological level, we're actually selfish. And any altruistic act that we engage in, we actually full well know that we're actually doing it for ourselves. And I think that's not true. I think sometimes we do have a secret hidden motivations, but sometimes we just do care about other individuals and we help them just simply because we do care. But our, you know, the occasional psychopath notwithstanding, yeah. I think most of us do that. And I guess Immanuel Kant would come up there. He would argue that any truly good action you do purely out of a sense of duty and not because 
you want to do it or you desire to do it. And I disagree with that, right? I think that the fact that we, that some people enjoy being altruistic doesn't imply that their altruism isn't real. I think the opposite is true, really. I think that an altruistic person is somebody that does enjoy being altruistic for its own sake, as opposed to to help achieve some other goal. You know, this relates to some other work I'm doing, distinguishing pathological altruism from non-pathological altruism. Empirical, that seems like another distinction here that seems important because pathological altruism, you don't enjoy. It actually comes compulsive and you're not enjoying the helping. It's not spontaneously enjoyable. It's like any addiction, right? That's interesting because we see some things that appear like altruism among humans that is really just like a compulsive need for self-validation. Indeed, yeah. In that sense, it's not an end in itself. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I do. And I guess it's, it's probably worth distinguishing, right, between whether altruism is adaptive in an evolutionary sense. That, that, that's one question. And then a, a separate question would be whether it's adaptive in the everyday sense that we care about, right? And so by the sounds of it, pathological altruism, that's defined in terms of its effect on our well-being, right? That's so, right. That's right. So who cares, again, who cares about Mr. and Mrs. Gene? It doesn't matter if it's adaptive in that sense, but in terms of how it affects the person, their well-being, the well-being of others uh, around them. Yeah, that's right. So can you talk a little bit about why the evolutionary approach itself is not enough to understand such a weird species as Homo sapiens? Why do we need culture? Well, I think it's because of culture that it's not enough. So somewhere along the line, we seem to evolve, the, we, we evolved a capacity for culture. And I presume, I think it's reasonable to say that that was because it was, it was useful for us to have a bit of flexibility in our behavior, ability to acquire behaviors that other people had figured out in the past and to use tools and to improve the tools and so on and so on. So that was sort of selected somewhere along the line. Once we had that flexibility, though, turn us into a kind of open system to a degree that's not true of other other species. And so having put it in place, it kind of escaped the genetic leash to quite a large extent. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we do that can't be directly traced back to natural selection. It could could be indirectly traced back in that we have this capacity for flexible behavior and culture. But we have all these massive patterns of behavior and belief systems and institutions that evolved culturally rather than evolutionarily. And they came about through the evolution of memes rather than the evolution of genes. So there's all sorts of weird stuff that we do, which I don't think is explicable just from evolutionary psychology. I totally agree with that. And, you know, like culture enabling us to evolve things like language to the degree that it's evolved in us leading to consciousness has given us this quirk where we have such flexibility and goal invention that doesn't exist among any other animal. I mean, we can have, like my friend, uh, my colleague Colin DeYoung loves to say like, well, where did like the motivation to be skee-ball champion, you know, of the world, like setting that goal, like cannot be directly explained. You know, one could say, well, it's tied to the self-esteem motive. Yes, but that misses the point that you've still created the content of a goal that cannot be directly linked to um, the natural selection process. Absolutely. Yeah. So I agree with that. And I really, and by the way, I like that you combine these two perspectives. It's not something you see all the time in discussions about evolutionary Mm -hmm. psychology. So, or maybe even most of the, you know, popular books on the topic. So I'm really appreciated you did that. On the psychology podcast, I try to, you know, see linkages to things that interest me as well. And then we can kind of like come up with synthesis and integrations. I love, it's exciting when that happens in real time, right? Yeah. I wrote a paper uh, about 10 years ago on uh, how the big bang of cultural explosion that happened. People don't agree exactly. Was it 25,000 years ago? Was it 40,000 yeah, years ago? 40, okay. 70, yeah. 70, the general trend seems to be going further back in time. Yeah, right? right. Yeah. And then Stephen Pinker's like made a good case for why it probably is even farther back. And yeah, but, you know, really looking at the linkage between that cultural explosion and creativity and human creativity, I mean, we, there was like zilch human creativity before that. Jeffrey Miller would say, well, our height of our creativity worth aesthetic hand axes used to attract mates, which you do talk about in your book, you know what I mean? But I mean, like, let's compare like aesthetic hand axes for like 2 million years, you know, versus like what happened in this really short period of time where culture, you know, evolved and then the capacities for creativity that came as a result. So I was wondering, i you talking about culture. Have you thought about its linkages to understanding like how human creativity evolved as maybe separate from sexual selection? 
Yeah. I mean, I do think creativity does... I don't have a strong view on how creativity evolved, but I don't think that it's 100% down to sexual selection. Yeah. I don't know. Creativity is so open-ended, right? Yeah. It can have effects in so many different domains. And it's useful for achieving any goal you care to name, from attracting a mate to being the ski ball champ or whatever it is, right? Creativity. You can use that for any of those different goals. So I imagine that um, it was useful for all of them and that selection would have favored a tendency to be able to creatively come up with good creative solutions to achieve whatever goals one happened to have, many of which do have obvious sort of <laughs> evolutionary precedents, right? So the desire to attract a mate, the desire to rise in status, the desire to just survive, look after your kids, all these kind of selection pressures, I think, would have favored it. Yeah. I like that. And it doesn't limit us to, you know, well, where did creativity come from? It's either natural or sexual. We got nothing else. You know, we have no other options. Yeah. Well, you know, bringing in the cultural perspective does open us up to the idea that maybe certain played on certain systems that we share with other animals, such as the general drive for exploration, for instance. I've been really interested yeah. in the drive for exploration as something that's not reductionistic to the mating motive. Because, you know, seven year olds are explorative before pre puberty. There's great playfulness and creativity. I don't think Jeffrey's model is quite complete there when we're trying to understand a complete understanding. I think it partly explains it, and he's quite brilliant in his book. But if we really want to understand this phenomenon of human creativity and flexibility, which is exactly what you nailed, you know, there's kind of a more general drive, as I see it, that we evolved, that perhaps culture has really drawn out more than it's done in like turtles. You know, there are very explorative turtles, yeah. but they haven't evolved the culture to kind of utilize it completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, indeed. So that's interesting, right? So so what do you think, what sort of selection pressures do you think favor the general exploratory, playful kind of creativity that we have? I guess, like if Jeffrey was sitting here, I, I, I like to take other people's perspectives as well as my own, right? If he was sitting here, he'd be like, well, come on. Obviously, those who like were exportive to like take risks to get to attract mates, to him, everything comes down to mates, <laughs> you know, like everything. So he would probably say like, well, the exportive drive originally evolved to attract mates, you know, but, but we now use it for other things. But we could think of many, many reasons why exploration would have been important for fitness in lots of different things, yeah. you know, like even inclusive fitness, you know, even in altruism. There's lots of, You're we don't have to just kids. Look, Yeah, sorry, go on. Looking after your kids. Yeah. Looking after your other relatives. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, just the fact that we conquered... That was that drive that got us to travel to other continents, you know, to get out of Africa yeah. in the first place, right? You know, like we must have been impacting the course of human evolution even back then when we were, you know, still when we weren't a single species, you know, when we were side by side with the Neanderthals, yeah. for instance, we probably outcompeted them and in part probably to our exportive capacities, maybe also to our aggressive tendencies Possibly, as well. We, we may have killed yeah. them. Unfortunately, we may have yeah. killed them or we may have slept with all of their women. This is one of the theories, right? Yep. And then gene drift occurred. So anyway, look, I just love riffing you know, with you about this and really think about all these different things. And it is precisely the fact that you were bold enough to combine these two perspectives that is what allowing me to riff on this right now. So thank you. You know, it's like, you open us up to a different kind of evolution that is something that is, it's fighting words to ever say uniquely human. Have you ever say that phrase among an evolutionary psychologist? It, they're fighting yeah. words, but I like to use the phrase uniquely developed because yeah, yeah, sure. it doesn't get me in as much trouble if I say uniquely developed. <laughs> and we can agree that this kind of process you're talking about, like mimetic evolution, it's pretty uniquely developed among humans, right? Isn't that a fair thing to say? I, I would say so. <laughs> yeah, there might be a touch of it, a little bit of it here and there in other species, but just we're taking it to a whole new level. I don't think there's any question about that, really. Yeah. So can you talk a little about mimetic evolution? How does it operate? You don't only rely on Dawkins, which was nice, and you make that clear that you draw on a lot of different people who have, have studied this, but he was pretty, you know, Richard Dawkins was pretty foundational in talking about mimetic evolution. Can you please talk about it a little bit? Yeah, sure. So the basic idea, basic meme theory idea is that so just in the same way that the genes that come to dominate in the gene pool are genes that have effects that cause them to stick around in the gene pool. So genes that are like selfish genes, genes that are good for themselves, stick in the gene pool. Basically, Dawkins transplanted that idea into the realm of culture. He said, you have cultural units, and he called those memes. And he said, which memes stick around? So the memes that are most likely to stick around 
are not necessarily the ones that are good for us, although often they are good for us, not necessarily the ones that are good for the groups in which those memes are found, although again, often they are. But the bottom line is that to stick around, the memes that are going to be selected and that are going to come to the fore in a culture are going to be those that are good for themselves. So selfish memes, memes that have effects that keep them around in the culture. An example might be a meme that is good at grabbing your attention. You notice it, it sticks in your mind, it sticks in your memory. That's the first step. The second step would be you have selection for memes that motivate people to, to pass them on in some way. Sort of an interesting idea that you want to tell your friend or that you want to impose on people or, or some other kind of way that makes you not only notice and remember the idea, but also then pass it on as well. Might be good for you, might be good for the group, but ultimately it just has to be good for the meme itself. Do you ever like scratch your head when you see what some of these YouTube videos that go viral? Like, do you ever, <laughs> as an evolutionary What's cultural... The appeal? Yeah, do you ever like, you're like, you know, have 5 billion views and you're like, why did this evolve, this meme? Yeah, why I do. And the funny thing is, exactly, why did this one win and, and yeah. win some other one? Why do people like watching this? Yeah. And I sometimes even have that effect when I'm enjoying watching it and I'm not even sure what, why it's so. <laughs> why are you enjoying it? Yeah. <laughs> on Facebook, I often, I must have been lingering quite often on cute kitten videos and cute puppy videos and things like that because I seem to be getting more and more of those <laughs> these days. And why are they so appealing? They, they are very, very appealing and contagious. And despite, you know, there's a bit of a waste of time in a way. You know, you just pointed something out that's actually really a good point is the algorithms we're creating allow us to custom tailor memes. They're like, oh, well, if you like this, we're going to like throw one Joe Rogan video or whatever. And then I get 500,000 Jordan Peterson videos in my inbox every day of my life. It's like, wow, like culture is imposing that. No, no, it's not posing. The right word would be amplifying perhaps, you know, this interplay between our nature and what we find attractive. And then culture has this amazing ability. Culture is not innocent. You know, some evolutionary psychologists or misconceptions of evolutionary psychology, right, is that it's like we're talking about these context independent modules. And that's the farthest thing from the truth, right? Like culture can really play a huge role in bringing out the worst or the best in humans, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And we behave so differently, right, from culture to culture, even though we've got the same basic human nature. Yeah. So a common criticism of evolutionary psych, I think, not a great one, not a fair one, is that it implies that stuff is just unchangeable. It says human nature is this and that's that. So, for example, if aggression is innate, humans are going to be aggressive and there's nothing we can do about it. But different cultural contexts can bring that out to a greater or a lesser degree. Yeah. And we have seen like a massive decline in, in violence over the course of the decades and centuries and millennia. And that's, that's a cultural difference, right? It's not a genetic difference. It's a cultural difference. But it's culture interacting with the same human nature, the same propensity for aggression. But it's just it's not inevitable that we behave aggressively or peacefully. Yeah. And you have this beautiful section in your book, The Future is Unridden. I mean, technically it is written. I talked to Shaq Carroll, the physicist, about this. Like, yeah, we don't, yeah, none yeah. of us know what it is, but <laughs> they're, they're, those physical laws are written. But I, your, no, your point is, I'm just being a little cheeky, but your point is very well taken. And, you know, you say, as mimetic evolution picked up steam, humans were transformed. No longer were we devices designed solely to pass on our genes. Suddenly, we became hybrid creatures, hybrid machines, <laughs> maybe from an alien perspective torn between passing on our genes and passing on our memes. This vision of our species helps to explain much of what most puzzled the alien scientist, our moral systems, our religions, our art and music and science. Cultural evolution is the key to unraveling the deepest mysteries of the human animal. You know, I got chills when I read that and it really made me think of, you know, you don't use this word in your book, but it seems like it's really ripe for integration with some research I do in positive psychology on just purpose, the need for human purpose, right? Like our ability to transcend ourselves in the sense that we can pass on ideas and help future generations and really impact future generations is something that makes us quite strange as well as quite human, just human. Yeah. Yeah. Strange and human in, in a really good way, potentially, right? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for the past four years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they are helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. 
Another thing you can do, which is new, is to become a patron of the show by going to www.patreon.com forward slash psych podcast. That's www.patreon.com forward slash psych podcast. There are various options that you can select, which include the ability to ask your own questions to a guest on the show and to have a 30 minute Skype session with me. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Okay, so I'm going to end here uh, this podcast asking you some Twitter questions. Do you see my tweet? I, I, I did. Yeah, I, I did, said, yeah. <laughs> ask Steve questions. Now, I'm not going <laughs> to ask you the question, you know, some of those questions, but I will ask you the most thoughtful ones, okay? You okay. know which one I'm talking about that I'm not going to ask. I, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Now our audience yeah, is yeah, so yeah, curious. No, by the way. What do you say? What do you say? <laughs> no. The answer is no. no. That, that okay. Not even for twenty dollars. <laughs> okay. A lot more than that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Max Bartleby, I hope I pronounced his yeah. name right. I'm not sure. He said, "Since you wrote the ape that understood the universe, there's been a series of publications casting doubt on the good genes hypothesis. What do you make of these developments, and do they fundamentally change our understanding of sexual selection?" Yeah. So so Max is a really thoughtful guy. And I definitely take those papers seriously. I can tell you that I'm a lot less confident in the good genes view of the evolution of my preferences than I used to be, than I was a year ago or two or three years ago. Uh, a lot less confident. So um, just to be clear for, uh, for the listeners, so the theory in question, it's, um, so there are a number of mate preferences that we have that seem to be products of evolution. They seem to reliably develop across different cultures. And the question is why? Now, the good genes theory is the idea that the traits that we find attractive indicators are good genes. So that means like they're indicators that the person has a relatively low mutation load and indicators that the complement of genes that they have is resistant to the local pathogens. That's a good theory. Uh, it seems though that the recent evidence suggests that as good and logical a theory as it might not be true for us, might not be true for all traits. I guess I'm not quite on the fence yet. So I think I'm still this side of the fence where I think if I had to bet I think there's probably, there probably is merit still to the good genes approach. But like I say, I'm a lot less confident in it. And that's it. the evidence is now very mixed. So I don't think we're really in the position to be throwing it away yet. But because it's so mixed, we shouldn't be confident that it's correct either. Sure. A lot of people use that in terms of attraction, understanding attraction and you know what are the traits that males select for females in short-term versus long-term meeting and females, males. But, you know, Again, there are all these like quirks where we depart from that, where we are deeply attracted to someone that might not actually be attractive, you know, yeah. obje- universally, you know, yeah. when I say that, like at that, I'm saying it's a fascinating thing that like, you know, we can also be unattracted to people who are attractive, you know, objectively. Indeed. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think that orangutans have such nuance, you know, they maybe less nuance. Maybe they are more just like, you know, their genes are lighting up, you know, that like that person has good genes. Yep. But we have this, again, we're flexible, right? And it's, it's uh, yeah. We are, we're, we're flexible and we're odd. And I think you're right. I think peacocks as well. I think the peacock with the best tail, all the females yeah. seem to like that. It's not the case that they have these quirky idiosyncratic tastes where some of them like this one, but then some of them like the one with a little exactly. not so colorful tail. Exactly. So why, right. Right. so weird, I don't know. Right. I mean, you never see one of the peahens saying like, oh, I just think it's so like cute and charming how small that tail, you know, but among humans, it's like we do. We're like, we're like, oh, you know, like what's your fetish? Like some of you people have like a fetish for like red hair. Some people have a fetish for they like a small nose. You know what I mean? Okay. Let's move on. Trey Rose said, what's his opinion? His being you. This is you. What's your opinion on the evolutionary explanations for moral disgust? And do you think it's a separate phenomenon or a linguistic variant of aggression? That's an interesting question, isn't it? It is interesting. Um, I think probably that is not a separate thing. I think we've evolved uh, disgust in certain kind of contexts, such as for pathogen, you know, meat that's gone off and things like that, that could toxins uh, evolve disgust in certain sexual contexts, like for, for close relatives, people that we grew up with. I think probably my guess is that moral disgust isn't something that's separately evolved. I tend to favor the idea that morality is primarily a, a product of culture and that it's just a bunch of stuff that we talk about, like we're trying to work out 
what's right and what's wrong. And anything where we're doing that, we call that morality. But it's not a cohesive evolutionary phenomenon. I think disgust feeds into that. It's one of the emotions that feeds into, that kind of shapes our morality. But, you know, you have a lot of uh, people these days who argue that we should extract disgust from the moral equation. So, for instance, when you're trying to evaluate the moral rightness or wrongness of, of gay marriage, for instance, some people influenced by their, their disgust toward same-sex sex, that feeds into their moral views on that topic. But a lot of people argue that it shouldn't. It's still morality, though, right? So mm. morality isn't necessarily closely tied to our instincts. Mm. Often it's not, right? Like, so we, we're naturally nepotistic, but we say we shouldn't be. We naturally want to lash out at people who, who harm us in some way. Often we say that we shouldn't do that. So mor- morality does seem to have come disconnected from a lot of our instincts, I think, including disgust. Really interesting. Thanks for that answer. Leon Hyler asked a question that's very near and dear to my heart. Possible evolutionary explanations for autism, other mental health conditions, moderate responses to these. I say near and dear to my heart because I'm really interested in how, why things like ADHD evolved, autism, dyslexia, you know, what are some of the evolutionary basis for uh, learning dis- difficulties and things? Yeah, so what do you think? Um, I tend to think that they're probably not adaptations these things. I think uh, an evolutionary psych perspective is really good at explaining stuff that we have in common with one another, whereas things like ADHD and autism and the like are relatively rare. And so I suspect that they're not adaptations. I don't think that they were crafted by natural selection or favored by selection. I think probably that's an example of a mistake that's very easy to make with evolutionary thinking, which is just kind of overextending adaptationist reason and sort of applying it too broadly. So it's really tempting, right? It's a very seductive kind of way to explain things. So it's very, very easy to say, this is an adaptation, that and this and the other thing. They're all adaptations. I think probably it's not. I think one reason for that is I don't think that, well, well, they're rare for a start, but also they tend to be associated with relatively low fertility, which seems unlikely as an adaptation. I think also that a stronger case has been made for other ways to explain them. So in the case of autism, for instance, I think that it's like a big part of it's genetic. And a lot of the genes that contribute to autism are seem to be what, what are called de novo mutations. So, so relatively new mutations, more a product of mutation selection balance. So you have sort of new mutations coming into the gene pool, but selection is unable to take them out fast enough. So you basically have a sort of low level of these, these genes that increase the likelihood of autism developing. Just a low level kind of remains because selection doesn't get rid of them as fast as they come into the gene pool. Perhaps similar for schizophrenia. Yeah, I was just going to say, Jeffrey Miller wrote a really interesting article applying that logic to schizophrenia and arguing why these things might be fitness indicators of attractiveness and arguing why uh, extreme schizophrenia might not be as attractive among humans you know, from a mating perspective. But whether or not you agree with that argument, I think that it's an interesting extension of that to think about a way, a framework for thinking about the evolution of lots of disorders. But there's a related idea about schizophrenia that I think is, is unproven, but certainly possible. Um, and that's that the genes that predispose people to schizophrenia, and those genes are found in people that don't develop schizophrenia, it might be associated with... Creativity. Creativity, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And the, the benefits of the creativity may outweigh the costs of, of occasional uh, schizophrenia Yeah, and keep them at the gene pool. Yeah, yeah, like schizotypy is yeah. it's very strongly correlated with creativity. Uh, just, yeah. you know, full-blown mental illness. It's hard to be creative when you're full-blown. But yeah, these mild or forms, the relatives of people with full-blown mental illness tend to be more creative than the general population. Bipolar disorder Bipolar, as well, right? That's right, that's right. I mean, I've written papers, yeah, on that exact, are making that argument that these exist in our gene pool because of the benefits they confer to the relatives. That's been the argument. Yeah. What are your thoughts on ADHD? Well, that one I would link to the exploration drive. You know, we were talking about earlier, you look at the DRD4, you know, you look at the genes that were um, selected, particularly associated with what we call, I mean, ADHD is just a label that in the school system we put on these poor kids who want to conquer new uh, countries. Yeah, they want to, you know, they, it's like, can you, exactly. do you know what I mean? It's like, can you imagine, like, we would probably put Christopher Columbus or, <laughs> yeah. I, well, maybe he's not the best example because that's not, he's controversial, controversial right? He's kind of like, he's, <laughs> yeah. but can you imagine putting that label on some of the earliest explorers of, if they were in a school system, we probably would have said they have ADHD, you know, because exactly. they're, exactly. they don't want to sit still and sit passively, exactly. passively consume information. 
And so I think that is actually a kind of a no-brainer in a sense, you know, yeah. that label we put in there is, is that phenomenon. And we're talking about the DRD4, you know, we're talking about the genes that code for proteins that lead, you know, to a phenotype of, I want to move around and, you know, see what's new, you know, and uh, stimulation. Exactly. And, and, and a, in a more sort of natural environment, that would have been just fine and dandy, right? Yeah. Uh, that would have been not a problem. Dandy. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a, that would make it a product of evolutionary mismatch. We're yeah. sticking these little, these little kids, these little primates into a completely unnatural setting that's fine for some of them or okay for some of them, but just not suitable at all. Yeah. That's precisely, yeah. I think that's what's going on there. So should we go on a Toby Lawson's question? Do you know all yeah, these people, by the way? Are these all you like your friends? No, no. <laughs> okay. I, I know Max, but okay. uh, I don't think I know the rest. Yeah. Okay, cool. Toby Lawson, has Evo Psych become hand-wavy catch-all explanation for human traits? There seem to be no explanation of underlying mechanism of how traits develop. SBK commentary, I disagree with that. But anyway, just, <laughs> but I'm, okay, back to what he's saying. Just ex post fitting into sex selection. I guess that's quite close to a common criticism of Evo Psych, which is that it's just a bunch of just so stories, right? And that we just sort of, we have these hand wavy explanations of here's, here's a trait, let's try to explain it. Maybe it evolved for this purpose. You know, it's not just sexual selection. There's, there are various other tools we have to explain it. I think that uh, to be as fair as possible to the criticism, I do think that there are cases where we perhaps do accept adaptation as explanations on relatively flimsy evidence. And we should be a bit hard on adaptation as explanations. But I think as a critique of the whole field, I think that it's, it's not a good critique. Actually, a ton of evidence in evolutionary psychology by now, decades and decades. There are literally thousands of publications on all sorts of different explanations, adaptationist explanations, but also byproduct explanations, mismatch explanations as well. So the evolutionary psych explanation for obesity isn't an adaptationist explanation. It's a, it's a mismatch one that we're in a, a novel environment where we have way too much food that is too good and we just eat tons of it. And so that creates obesity. It's not... It's not an adaptation. That's one of the best-known evolutionary psych explanations. There's a ton of evidence, I think, that evolutionary psychs have marshaled. So it's not just hand-waving. Even if it's some of the explanations are not correct, but I really think it's fair to say it's just hand-waving. So I was trying to understand this person's question in particular because it seems like they wanted they were asking about human traits. So one way I interpret that question is, like, how does evolution explain the existence of human variation in personality traits, perhaps, or psychological traits. Now, maybe I'm inferring more in this person's question that this person really meant, but I was thinking that's interesting because I've seen some really interesting stories that I think are quite plausible that Daniel Nettle, you know, has come up with about the evolution of traits. And I don't see them as just just so stories because there is at least empirical evidence suggesting that there are trade-offs on all parts of the continuum of each of the big five personality traits, for instance. Like, it, there's both benefits and disadvantages of being agreeable, you know, conscientious. Or disagreeable, exactly, yeah, exactly. or extroverted, or yeah. introverted, yeah. exactly. It's a good idea. That, you know, I think it's not just hand-waving. It's made a good case, I think, that because there are benefits and costs at both ends of the spectrum, yeah. that selection just naturally maintains a range of genes that create a range of individual differences in personality expression. Yeah. So we may, may or may or may not answer this person's uh, in, original intent of the question. Hopefully, but, yeah. yeah. Okay, so last two, which we, I've saved the grandiose ones, you know, this is it. Michael Shermer. Everybody knows Michael Shermer. Yeah, legend. Legend, this guy. Okay, so he says, who will eventually win in an epic battle between our better angels and our inner demons? Time frames, 2020 election, 2050 climate change deadline for carbon emissions, 2100 population, 2200 factory farming, anytime nuclear war? Hmm. So there's a great question, and I'm not sure I have a great answer for it. I find it really hard to figure out where we're going to go. And I kind of bounce around in terms of whether I'm feeling optimistic or pessimistic, depending on if I've just been reading Michael Shermer or Pinker or Ridley or you know these rational optimists. I tend toward optimism. Then when I hear, I think this morning I heard that Trump has just announced he wants to boost the nuclear arsenal. And then I'm feeling not quite so, I know, not quite so um, optimistic at all. But I should put my neck out and, and make some predictions rather than just sitting on the fence. So I'm, I'm going to say that I think our better angels are going to win. I think 2020 um, elections are going to be kind of ugly. I don't think that the better angels are going to win then. But I think and I hope that we could solve the climate change problem. I don't think that's a completely impossible task, as daunting as it looks. 
what else was on the list? So we had climate change, carbon emissions. Uh, well, that's similar to climate change. Yeah. Population. Population was one in the factory farming. Population, I'm going to put my vote for optimism. Factory farming, I'm going to put my vote for optimism as well, definitely. But I really hope that we manage to produce you know, meat without a nervous system. What's it called? Not factory meat, but um, lab-grown meat. That would be wonderful. So it would be great, right? It'd be be able to create meat without the suffering of a sentient being. Right. You know, humans seem to think like human suffering is the only kind of suffering that matters. And yeah. uh, it drives me nuts, you know, that we can't think beyond that. The fact that we are starting to think about other animals suffering, that kind of thing, I think is one of the great products of culture. You know, yeah. it's, not, it's not instinctive, it's not natural, yeah. it's come from talking and thinking, and it's a cultural phenomenon. Good, I love that. And, you know, our capacity for perspective taking, I love that. Okay, last question. Christine Snyder, Christine M. Snyder says, is everything going to be okay? Uh, yes, it's going to be okay. Steve, thank you so much for the great work you do in public science communication as well as your research and for being on the podcast today. Thanks very much, Scott. It's been a real pleasure. For me too. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.